So for those of you who haven't met me, me, uh, met me yet, my name is Peggy Liu, and I am from Shanghai. Um, for those of you who are interested in keeping in touch with me, I'm Shanghai Peggy at the various platforms, Facebook and Gmail, Twitter, etc. I'm the founder and chairperson of an organization called Juice, which was started in 2007 out of the first public dialogues between US and Chinese government officials on clean energy. And we have basically traced China's rapid green journey since the beginning. Um, my job is basically to change the world through societal scale change, catalyzing environmental initiatives. Today, what Josef has asked me to sort of broaden the dialogue from the local, from the land that we're standing on um, to something much broader, something that you might not be familiar with, to show you the scale and pace of change in China. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to the organizers, to all of the speakers, especially the Maori teachers here who have taught me so much about appreciating the land that we come from. So I would like to show you the land that I currently live in for the last 13 years, which is Shanghai. This is actually a view outside my window. Unfortunately, this is also a view outside my window. You probably have heard about the pollution, but I want you to actually appreciate the fact that every single person in China not only lives in this and breathes it, but we taste it every day. Um, this is where uh, you know the second and third tier cities in China, they normally look like this. So what we've been doing since about 1990 is as we've started to industrialize, is we've been raising these buildings very quickly. So this is actually was right outside my door. In 1990, this was part of Shanghai called Pudong, Lu Jiazui. Ten years later, it looked like this. Another ten years later, it looked like this. Today, the building on your right that has a crane on top is the second tallest building in the world and has been completed. This is a view outside my backyard to the freeway um, that is sort of decorated with neon purple light. This landscape goes throughout the entire city of 26 million people that I live in. So urbanization drives everything, energy, economy, culture. It is the fundamental thing you have to understand if you need to understand China today. 700 million people are moving from rural areas into cities or being encompassed by new cities. And the reason is because for every single migrant moving into a city, the economy benefits by making more money. So they are spending a lot of money, in fact, $6.75 trillion in just a handful of years to spend on building roads and grid and buildings, and every, subways, everything you can imagine that a city needs. 129 million homes built in just 20 years. McKinsey estimates that in 20 years, 50,000 new skyscrapers, over 30 floors high, will be built across China. 60,000 new kilometers of highways, 100 new airports. So I know these numbers are a little bit big, but if you can just imagine, what we're doing is we're building whole new cities at a time. Each of these cities within 10 years pop up from literally nowhere. 226 cities of over a million each. So just to compare, there's only 35 cities of a million people or more in all of Europe. So this is very crowded, but it's, it's across the entire land of China. So again, I live in a city of 26 million, but that's growing rapidly, and that's encompassing the cities around it into one major region, sort of uh, megatropolis. So China is, a lot of people ask, are, are they trying to take over the world? Well, they have no ambitions about being the leader of the free world but they have already become the leader of the rail world. And I'm going to show you how pervasive this has become in China. This is a concept called transit-centered living. And this is how 
all of our cities are developing, where on top of a subway stop, a transit node, you would have a school, you would have residential, you would have office, you would have a lot of restaurants and bars, all within 10 to 15 minutes of walking distance. This is the block that I live on. So um, the stars are exit stops for three subway lines. So to get here to New Zealand, I went downstairs, 29 stories, I went into the subway, I went 30 minutes to the international uh, airport, and I checked in. If I were to go domestically, I can go 30 minutes the other way on the subway, I can go up a three-story escalator and check in. One more stop, I can check in to the high-speed rail, five hours to Beijing. These are three subway lines underneath my feet. The two circles are two brand new developments. All of this is happening within a 10 year span. So even though on a day to day basis, I'm very annoyed by the you know, construction, the noise, the dust, but I know like every other citizen in China knows that someday soon, life is gonna get very, very good. And so that keeps us going. The Shanghai Metro, just to give you another example of scale, is the longest in the world today. But in 2020, we're going to be double the size of the London Metro, right? If you were to visit me in Shanghai, I wouldn't take you around in a car necessarily because of the traffic and the congestion, but I would really want to take you on the subway. This is an example of the rail stations that we're building in every major city. This is the Shanghai Rail Station where it can take the high-speed rail to Beijing. You can probably fit 10 airplanes in here is my guess, at least. And this is just one floor. The high-speed rail, and what that means is it goes over 200 kilometers per hour, or very, very fast. We're building 30,000 kilometers by 2020. It's going to connect, by that time, 80% of our large cities. For those of you from California, at least probably a third of you are from California, you might know that Jerry Brown introduced this concept of uh, north to south high-speed rail in 1980. Where is California now? Still hasn't been built. Okay, we started building in about 2007. By 2012, we have the longest rail network of high-speed rail in the world. To do this, we're spending $724 billion in the next five, uh, several years on top of what we've already spent. What this means is not just prosperity for China and convenience for China, but it means regional prosperity for Europe, for Russia, all the way down to Kenya. One Belt, One Road is probably the single most influential concept you have never heard of, because China is terrible at marketing. But Obor, One Belt, One Road, is tying all of these routes together with high-speed rail and with maritime routes. This is a new uh, Silk Route 2.0. This is 65 countries all with bilateral agreements, all of which we want free trade agreements with. This covers currently four billion people, or half of all the world's GDP. So already, about a year and a half ago, a train can go, container train can go from Ishu, the factory town of China, to Madrid in 21 days. Pretty soon, you'll be able to go from King's Cross, London, to Beijing in two days on high-speed rail. What this means is, is that, for those of you who study economics, you know that transport to ship goods means prosperity. Prosperity means peace. So this is the new geopolitics of regional prosperity that is China's vision with all of these 65 different countries. Now notice, New Zealand, I don't think is on the map. <laughs> notice that America is not on this map. They estimate that we're gonna to have to spend two to three trillion dollars per year. And there's already three banks that have been set up to start fund this. Each of the countries are also funding it, matching it. Private money is also going into this. So tremendous, tremendous economic growth is gonna come from Obor, the terrible, terrible name of Obor. 
A lot of people ask me, is China going to go green, and is it going to go green fast enough? My answer is that it's really going to look something like this. So let me talk a little bit about how China tackles challenges, especially in the face of climate change. One of the secrets that a lot of people don't know about China is, is that it's one of the only countries in the world that has mandatory government training. It trains, like let's say a mayor, mandatory 12 days minimum each year. If you're gonna be promoted to governor or something higher, you might sit in this class for two to three months, maybe up to a year. If you're special, you might get to go to Harvard Kennedy School. This is a class that I led of 50 mayors where I brought in the uh, former vice mayor of London talking about their climate action plan. They have eight of these mandatory government training academies. I teach at three of them. So I'm a professor at the China Academy of Governance, a lecturer at the China Executive Leadership Academy of Pudong, the National Academy of Mayors for China on how to build eco-cities. We've been doing this since 2008 and we've taught a thousand mayors and central government officials. Think about the way that we are able to push new, like things like CFLs, what are CFLs, right? What is smart grid? What is clean energy, distributed generation? All of that goes through this to the people who have the resources to make great change. They say that this is a reason for China's harmonious, fast growth. The other thing that you should know is who makes up our government, right? So in the US, most people who run the government are lawyers. There might be a handful of actors and comedians, right? <laughs> in China, they're mainly engineers and scientists with master's degrees. Now, there's been a shift. 10 years ago, or the last 10 years before Xi Jinping, it was all scientists and engineers, civil engineers, would be in my classes with master degrees. So this was the age of technocrats. Now under Xi, we have scientists, engineers, but a lot of economists and one journalist. I call this the age of techonomists. So what's happened is the first 10 years, we had massive efforts to invest in clean tech, rapid urbanization, so all the stuff that engineers like to play with. This 10 years, starting about three years ago, we now have publicly supported slower growth, but sustainable growth, more efficient growth, more value-added manufacturing, more services, more consumption, smarter cities. This is a massive shift for China. So because we have this background, you'll see people like the person who does our climate change talk negotiations, Xie Zhenhua, with Christiana Figueres, the former head of UNFCCC. China in even 2007 came out with a national climate change plan which said, we believe in climate change, it's caused by man, or humans I should say, and we, China, need to do something about it in 2007. It's undebated within the country. The other thing you should know about China is, is that we, even though you might think of us as Russian communism, as German communism, as something scary, as something anti-democracy, actually the better way to think about it is China runs itself like an MNC, a multinational corporation. We're like GE, we're I IBM, we're Cisco, we're Microsoft. We have a CEO, we have a chairman, we have a board, the state council, we have mayors and governors, party secretaries at a local level who are our branch managers. We have a recruiting and HR department called the Central Organization Department. We have business plans that are every five years. These business plans, I'm showing you the latest one, or actually the, the last three, no, sorry, the last two. They have numerical metrics that we are measured against. And this is then divided to every single local mayor and governor. They have to meet these or they're not promoted. Okay. So in the face of climate change, yet fast growth, what's happening on the energy side? Well, unfortunately it means that we're doubling our power grid, right? Every 
uh, sorry, we're, we're doubling in size in the next 15 years. So we're adding basically a Europe of grid each year. This is, for those of you who are into grid, this is terrifying. So what if this is all coal-based? Well, luckily, our very you know, smart and well-intended, climate change-believing technocrats said, we're going to aim for 15% renewables by 2020. That means we have to reduce coal by 55%. These are huge absolute numbers in terms of change. We're going to aim for 20% renewables by 2030. And just to give you an idea of what this means in terms of absolute numbers, it means that we're going to have to add the entire grid capacity of the United States in renewables for China to get to 20%. Now, we're already talking about can we get to 60% renewables by 2050? And this is just almost unthinkable. But people are already laying out the plans for this. So it is possible, which is fantastic for the world. So what's happened is, is that it, or as early as 2011 and 2012, although you might not know it, China already has become the leading investor in renewable energy. It's become the leading renewable energy powerhouse in terms of production in 2013. This was four years ago, right? We're putting our money where our mouth is, right? So $5 billion in subsidies over a period of five years in just new energy vehicles. So as a result, one company alone has skyrocketed in terms of electric vehicles and electric batteries. We have over 200 companies now producing electric vehicles in China just within the last few years. Now, we're not just piloting um, in companies. We're piloting in whole cities at a time for every single imaginable clean energy technology. So this one is carbon emissions trading schemes. It's a fundamental step towards carbon taxes and a new monetary scheme to measure environmental impact of coal. So we, in the last few years, have been piloting different schemes in seven regions, and this year we're going to do a national launch that takes the best of the best of each of these into one. Now, the reason why this is fascinating is because China never expected all of these seven pilots to succeed. They expect failure. We are experimenting a city at a time. We know to do this, we do not have the scientific, radical, innovative minds in-house. We need to bring them in-house to China from abroad. So they've launched the Thousand Talents program, which is now on its third or fourth generation, where they'll pay you a million RMB to spend half the year there. They'll give your spouse a job, your children housing, uh, sorry, schooling. They'll pay for that. They'll give you uh, meals. They'll give you a job in the province that you want it if you bring your talent to China. Okay, so what we're trying to do is recognize that we have no radical innovation within China because of the Cultural Revolution wiping it out. However, we can do tweak evasion. All right, we can localize. We can do scale evasion. We can scale at city scale. We can commercialize very quickly. So, scale is actually a form of IP. So this is something that I would like the New Frontiers members to really think about, is not just to come up with the good ideas, but to look to China as to how it's scaled at giga scale and giga pace. So as a result, China has moved from the factory of the world to the clean tech laboratory of the world in just 10 years. One of the other things that you should know is, is that the government is not afraid of putting massively different, radically, uh, just um, big, big, amazing policies out there, one after another after another. So, you know, Lao Tzu is one of our philosophers, and um, he's like Confucius, right? Uh, that, that level. And he said, be not afraid of growing slowly. Be afraid of only of standing still. This is a great uh, one quote to summarize policy action in energy for China. 
So I'm going to try and go through this very quickly and not go through each of the slides, but I'm just going to show you in 2007 when we came out with the National Climate Change Program. 2009, we were at the, uh, did a COP commitment to cut carbon intensity radically. In 2013, we established the Circular Economy Strategies and Action Plan to fundamentally change the energy use of steel and aluminum and paper and petroleum, et cetera heavy industry. In 2013, we established the Air Action Plan, which basically reduces pollution radically. In 2014, we established the National Climate Change Plan, which um, mandat has mandatory caps of coal emissions uh, by heavy industry. In 2014, we had the historic US-China joint uh, announcement on climate change leading up to the Paris COP talks, where we promised to cap CO2 absolute cap of CO2 by 2030. In 2014, we uh, launched the Energy Strategy Action Plan, again, absolute coal consumption cap. In 2014, we announced national carbon market in 2017, I, I mentioned that earlier. We also announced taxes on gasoline and diesel that would then fund environmental plans. In 2015, we had this uh, radically um, different environmental law which has unlimited fines for not only companies but individuals if they pollute. Uh, we came out with the Water Pollution Prevention and Control Plan, which Gary would be happy about, which puts 320 billion US dollars into cleaner water. Of course, we're starting from a really low point because 90% of our water is polluted, right? Um, again, law and air pollution and prevention control. 2016, the 13th five-year plan with numerical targets. So those are just some, some examples of the policies, one after another after another. It's like a bullet ricocheting. And compare that to, let's say, the US, which not only hasn't been able to establish these types of policies, but I think now it's going backwards. So as a result, China has decoupled energy and economic growth. Only California and Sweden have been able to do this. What does that mean? It means that as our economic growth or GDP has slowed down slightly, actually our energy consumption has dramatically reduced. So this is what we need to do in order to get to the sustainable vision that New Frontiers imagines. Something that shocks every journalist that I talk to governments that I work with from Norway to UK uh, to New Zealand is, is that China has already reached peak oil consumption and peak coal consumption. So for those of you in the energy industry who understand this, and because China is the number one consumer of energy resources around the world, this fundamentally changes energy economics. By the way, we've, we've closed over 130 large coal-fired power plants already in construction or existing because our, coal, our uh, demand is much lower than capacity. So my message to you is, is that China's continued climate action is not gonna stop because Trump has come to you know, the twilight zone. Um, the reasons why we are going green are internally driven. It's part of the China dream to balance economic growth and environmental protection. We want to be a convener rather than a leader. Most importantly, we're not in a race with others for some sort of economic prize. We're in a race away from the Cultural Revolution towards a more livable China. So as we go from chief polluter to chief eco-solutions provider, I see a lot of partnership opportunities for New Zealand with China and every other country with China on innovation and on new trade routes to create low-cost, sustainable solutions, not just for China, not just for New Zealand, but for other countries like Southeast Asia, for Africa, for the continent of Africa, where we can deploy it everywhere, again, at gigascale and gigapace. So one of the great examples of collaboration, specifically for New Frontiers, is food education. This, in last year, 2016, at the UN level, has become a new global priority. Because for many of you, you realize that the, our food choices, every bite we take, affects both personal and planetary health and economic health. This is a single golden lever 
to change the development pathways of entire countries. Yet no country really has, uh, or very, most countries other than Japan and possibly Korea, has a formal food education program. So I suggest that we work together on food education for kids. Um, sorry, it's also, as of last year, a national priority for China. So I suggest that we work together, New Zealand and JUICE in China, to create bilingual English and Maori uh, play-based education for young kids. This is an example of the curriculum that we've created from Eat a Rainbow Every Day to I'm a Poo Detective to Chomp Chomp Yum. All play-based, based on board games, based on fun, based on cooking, based on gardening, based on songs teaching about how much sugar is in your drinks, teaching about real food versus fake food, being able to distinguish the two, or where your food comes from, all based on bilingual flashcards. So I'm out of time, but I will be leading workshops in the afternoon. I welcome you to join me if you're interested in collaborating in some way with China, with JUICE, on food, and for all of our health. Thank you very much.